So this class, Teaching Multimedia Authoring Tools, is based primarily around the ideas of a gentleman by the name of Richard Mayer. Um, Dr. Mayer is out of San Diego State University, and he has written the definitive book on multimedia learning. That's the book we use in the class. Um, his work, though, is, and this is something you have to really understand about Dr. Mayer, is he is an educational psychologist. So he isn't necessarily um, here to talk about um, teaching as much as he is about when we use multimedia to teach with, why or why doesn't it work with students? Here's the seminal work. In other words, if you walk into a room full of people who are designers of multimedia and you drop his name, people will nod and look at you. Uh, his, his writings are a little dense. And as you'll see here in a second, when we look at the modules, we will spend a good portion of the first two or three classes talking about Mayer. I call it the big lift. Uh, we have a major uh, project to do uh, with Mayer. The rest of the class will be really more, frankly, fun than anything else because we'll be using different tools that reflect the different ways that we can look at multimedia. Uh, one of the things that I do not like about Mayer's work is that he focuses around the idea, or he focuses around the use of PowerPoint. And, you know, uh, when I used to teach this class originally, we had a, a separate volume that we used um, that was all about the six rules of PowerPoint. And I think what's happened, and I think that's what the rest of the class reflects, is, of course, multimedia has become so much bigger than just PowerPoint um, presentations. And in fact, if you go back and look at the history of PowerPoint, it was never intended. It was never intended to be a teaching tool. Um, it was always intended to be nothing more than a presentation tool. Comparison of, you know, first quarter sales to second quarter sales, or a way to say this is how we're going to proceed on a certain aspect of whatever our uh, focus is in our business or our teaching. It was never meant to be a teaching tool. And so what you've seen happen is people will try to shoehorn. Uh, I see this all the time where teachers will pass out the paper version of the PowerPoint with the notes section included. And then they do the PowerPoint up front and the kids fill in the notes on the PowerPoint and that becomes their study guide. Mayor will show you why that doesn't work. And so after we get done with all of that, the, the next modules that we'll do, we will basically look at how looking at this through the new lens that we have of Mayor we can see how the various multimedia things that we can create, and my goodness, it's, it's almost limitless what we can do now, um, why they work and why they don't work. And I would include in this, although we don't really do it in class, but I would include in, include in this the sort of what I would call the high end of multimedia, and that would be your iMovies and your Pinnacles and your Premieres and, of course, uh, Apple's um, just went out of my head, <laughs> uh, and I know how to do it. But anyway, those kinds of video editing tools, uh, Final Cut Pro, thank you, Steve. Final Cut Pro, um, those kind of high-end editing tools, even though we think that's something totally different, when you look at them through Mayer, they, you suddenly realize why sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. So what I'd like to do, and since you're no pro at this, you just bear with me uh, because we have other people in the class. I uh, just want to go down the left-hand side so everybody can see where stuff lives and explain how it works. Then I'll go through the modules, and then next week we'll jump into module number one, 
we won't take long in module number one because all it is is setting up a separate platform to host all the stuff that we're going to create in the class. Um, and then after that, we'll do in our module two, we'll do a deep dive, deep, deep dive into Mare. So let's look over here. So uh, the syllabus is here and the syllabus is correct. Um, here's where our modules live. This is where you'll be creating something uh, using a tool called VoiceThread. VoiceThread is also a multimedia tool. Um, I have been using VoiceThread for 12 years. And it is, um, I still think it's a powerful tool and, and we'll spend time talking about it because we're going to use it as your way of demonstrating your understanding of Mayor's principles. Uh, below that is the link, of course, to get you in to collaborate. And then here will be the 690 recordings. What I normally do is, um, is I will record, obviously, and then, and you'll see up here, I can show you. See, I've started the recording right here. And when it gets done, it shows up in the same space as um, where all this is. But what I also do is I'll take that recording and I will download it and then upload it to YouTube because I get a much cleaner recording out of it. YouTube does its magic when you upload um, video to it. So it comes out a lot cleaner. I will leave in the 690 recordings the link to the Collab Ultra recording, the original one. But then I will send out to you in an announcement the link that would take you to the YouTube recording. A lot of people say they enjoy that because they can literally put their tablet, their laptop, their phone down, watch the video while they're on a computer and doing the work. Uh, here's our assignments. Uh, I'll be honest with you, things are a little in flux around here as far as assignments go uh, and where we're hosting them. I'm going to keep mine in um, Blackboard uh, until, I, in fact, I tried to set up Folio Tech today and uh, it didn't work. So I'm going to just keep it, we'll keep all of our assignments in Blackboard because that is a recognized process and strategy uh, that the registrar recognizes. And in fact, you can dump your grades out of the Blackboard space straight over into the registrar grade. So I'm going to keep all that here uh, until I understand what we're trying to do with Folio Tech. It's probably my fault, but you know, I gave it a shot. I went to the trainings and then when I tried to set it up, it didn't work. Let's do a dive into the modules. And here we go. So what we'll do next week is we'll use this tool called PBWorks and we will create a wiki. Now, a lot of people will ask me, why are you using a wiki? Why are you doing all this? I find that the wiki is a way to put different kinds of multimedia. So in other words, if you create different kinds of multimedia using different kinds of multimedia tools, the wiki becomes a, a really simple way for you to organize all that. That wiki then can be linked, say, over to a Google Classroom. So there's nothing that prevents me from having a PBWorks and having a Google Classroom. They, they talk to each other. Um, I find that using a PB works as opposed to say using Google sites, which is the Google's um, website creation piece. <coughs> Excuse me. There I go. The website creation piece site is a little light and a little finicky. I guess it's the best way to describe it. What I like about PB works is it's very straightforward. It's what we call flat HTML. It's not CCS, not content style sheets, none of that stuff. It's just very straightforward, very straight up how you can create and then post things into it. It makes use a lot of the ability of, of doing embeddable code. We've talked about that in other classes. The idea that you can create something that then creates a code that's made up of the, could be Java, could be uh, Flash, 
it could be HTML5, that it can then be placed into something like a wiki, and then it just it's there. Uh, the coolness about things like VoiceThread is not only are they there, but they are then connected back to the original creation that you made. So if you wanted to use the wiki as a jumping off point for people using the VoiceThread um, and Padlet and a lot of these other tools that you've seen me use, then it becomes very simple that they, they are connected. They, they link. So we'll do that next week. And then after that, here comes our friend. Um, you'll notice that I have here videos that I have done before. And as you can see, this was in fall of 2019. What I do is I go back and if I revisit these and I think they still have merit, um, I'll keep them. And then I'll just put in the ones that we film here, which will be the YouTube videos. So if you want to, you can come in here and watch these uh, in asynchronous time. You don't have to physically be here. We'll be using the voice thread. And the voice thread, like I said, it's a link up here on the left-hand side. Uh, it's a very simple tool to use. Uh, but it's extremely powerful to use. Um, it was primarily developed as a way of, and this is their verbiage, not mine, of having a conversation in the cloud. It allows you to incorporate, let me show you, it allows you to incorporate just about anything. So as you can see here, I can incorporate a PowerPoint, or I can incorporate Google Slides, I can incorporate videos, images, uh, screen captures, and hyperlinks, uh, process for embedding in. It just allows you to put anything in there. Then the cool part about it is, I don't know if, you've, if you have ever done this kind of thing before, but narration in a PowerPoint, eh, it's gotten better. But the problem with it is, when you do it in VoiceThread, you have the ability to have people be able to respond to it in voice. Now, VoiceThread has changed a little bit in the sense that you can now use text in a VoiceThread as well. I don't know how I feel about that, frankly. Um, you know, when I say they used to have a limit on the amount of text, heck, now you can put a whole you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pages worth of text into a, a voice thread note. I, I kind of like, well, we've got other tools to do that. Thank you very much. So what I have really always enjoyed about it is the fact that I can have these um, multimedia presentations that I can create, but yet I can have them annotated, and the annotations can contain comments back from other students. Um, I've done demonstrations of VoiceThread here at the university, um, you know, not to toot my horn, but I'm the one that got it put into Blackboard. But when I've done it here, one of the things that I try to show people, I see it working in two areas really, really well, and that's foreign language, and that's medicine. And the reason why is because in the foreign language, as you can probably guess, is I can have a very visual display of what it is that we might be talking about, but yet at the same time, I can be speaking the language. Then I can have you give me a feedback in the language that would represent your understanding of what I've just talked about, or vice versa. You can have the presentation in a you know English app and then require the students to look at it and then translate back what they think it would sound like in whatever language they're learning. Now, in medicine, what we did with medicine, it's really kind of cool, is you can create simulations. Remember, it can hold anything in there, right? Videos, etc. So we would create; they would create uh, simulations, um, especially in uh, worked with a, a group of folks um, over in med that did emergency medicine. And so they wanted to kind of set up a scenario. So like they would have a video of a patient coming in to an emergency room and presenting a, a set of uh, problems that they would then ask the students to reply to. 
<clears throat> in other words, if you if this kid or this person came into your emergency room and they were behaving this way or they had these symptoms that they were presenting, what would be your course of action? And of course, then the fact that I can comment back to that in a verbal way shows that number one, how I can think on my feet. And then number two, how I can have that sort of clarity about my understanding of what the symptoms that are being presented actually mean. It's cool. I like it a lot. Now, what you guys aren't going to like is the fact that I'm going to ask you to create a voice thread about Mayer that contains all 10 of the principles that he has in his Mayer's voice thread, or Mayer's multimedia learning principles. They're not difficult. In fact, some of them, I think, some of them are kind of very similar. And don't worry, we're going to talk all about this. We're going to walk through each one of them. What I want you to do is in creating your voice thread, you'll be creating a slide for each one of the principles and you'll have sub slides. In other words, you'll have a slide that says this is principle so and so. And then you're going to define the principle. You're going to get an example of it. You're going to get the case for it. You're going to create a word cloud for it. You're going to get, you do a prompt question. Trust me, everything you need to do this is inside this module. Okay. Um, and as I said, I will hold your hand and we will walk through everything we need to know about what Mayer talks about. Um, if you look up here, you got a sense of it. Um, one of the things that he is, he is really famous for is using the idea of what's called dual channel. And dual channel is a fascinating thing that we don't pay enough attention to in education. And by that, I mean in, in pre presentation of material in education. It's a very simple idea. Your brain has two ways of receiving information. That's your visual and that's your auditory. We as human beings are very well equipped. Even though we have problems like me with vision, we still have the ability to recognize that something is out there. I mean, if you think about it, you had to evolutionarily otherwise you'd be eaten up by everything around you so you had to recognize oh that's a bad thing i'm getting back up in the tree because we have that ability we are immediately visual people and if you think about that our culture my goodness our culture has become so so visual in everything that we have now um, I can remember when, you know, we started seeing signs that were just pictures and how everybody was talking about, well, how do you know what that means? Now we don't think twice about it. Here's the thing. You cannot. So you've got this auditory signal coming in that's explaining what the visual signal is seeing. If the auditory signal and the visual single signal don't sync up in other words if it's what you're talking about is not what you're seeing your brain basically goes what <laughs> and there's just this moment of i call it the screeching brakes where your brain just kind of goes i what and what mayer did as a psychologist he really went into the nuts and bolts of how we see and decode and put into short-term memory long-term memory etc cetera, etc cetera. One of the most powerful examples of multimedia learning, and you know this if you've ever been around small children, are picture books. And the power of the picture book is, and we do this, and I'll, I'd have a, I'll, I'll, you will have to ask forgiveness of me because I mean, I'll ask forgiveness of you. I have a PowerPoint that's rather long, and but I think it's very clear in what we're trying to do. The thing about it is. Um, when you look at picture books, the pictures are very clear. Um, and then if there's words associated with it, they are words that are very clear and very clearly associated with the pictures. Now, one of the things that Mayer points out is, he says, if you think about that early, early beginnings of when we learned to read, and we relied upon the pictures in the books to give us those content, context clues about what we were reading. 
if you think about one of the most, you know, loved genres of reading, and that's graphic novels, comic books, it's because of all the closeness of the text to what the pictures are. And if you look at it from the viewpoint of text, in other words, high-end textbooks, go look at a medical textbook and see how many pictures are in it. That's a very oversimplification of Mayer. Don't worry, we'll get deeper into it. As I said, that's our heavy lift. That's what we'll spend some serious time with. Then, we're not going to set Mayer aside. We're going to look at Mayer through all these other different tools that we can use. And the first one we're going to look at is a tool called Animoto. And what Animoto does is it allows you to create a music video. Um, the reason why I like Animoto is because it's extremely simple to use, but it's extremely powerful in how it creates a message. Um, and the Animoto has changed over the years. And I'll be honest with you, I think what we may end up doing is we may end up going in here and creating our own account. We could have a free account and using it because it looks like the free account version is much more interesting to play with than the paid account that I have. I don't know why. I don't know why my paid account hasn't been upgraded to, you know, something better. But that's okay. We can we can we can use the the free account. It isn't a big deal. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to talk about digital storytelling. All of this is digital storytelling from here on out. Um, and one of the things that I find so fascinating about digital storytelling is that it is as old as human beings are. Uh, sitting around the campfire and, and exchanging information. And so the question then becomes, why would we do this? What is the power of this in multimedia? Well, when we tell stories as a way of explaining something to people, when you look at the reason why it works so well, Mayor will tell you, is because we're building links to new knowledge to prior knowledge. And that is one of the keys of multimedia learning. If the old knowledge that we have in our head helps us see the connections to the new knowledge that's ahead, and one of the best ways of doing that is storytelling. And so when we think about the kinds of stories that we were told in the various, you know, subjects that we had to take, you know, stories that have to do with social studies is a given. Stories about history is a given. But we also had stories about science and math. And that helps us get our, to ground us in what we're trying to understand. Now, we have two tools that we can use for this. And the reason why is the beyond, uh, we'll have a, you'll have to have a free account for that as well. Vion is now has morphed. It used to be called GoAnimate, and it was strictly a teaching tool. And it's a shame they, I guess they figured they could make more money by being a tool that could be used by advertisers. But it's still a good tool, don't get me wrong. And it, it kind of gets us a peek into the doorway of making sophisticated multimedia cartoons um, without a lot of heavy understanding of vector graphics and Java and Alt Flash and all those other tools. Uh, and it's also HTML5 based, so it runs really, really cleanly in a web environment. The other tool that we'll use is, um, and you'll notice here it says or, is Zimmer Twins. Zimmer Twins have been around forever. And the reason why I show Zimmer Twins is this is a tool that you could use with kids. Beyond, you would not probably end up using with kids. Beyond is where you would make content that you would share with kids. But Zimmer Twins, you can actually, it's free. You can just send kids in there uh, after you create an account and they become a part of your class. You can send them in and they can create their own little Zimmer Twins. Um, I don't know, cartoon is the right word. Um, but it's, it's, it's an easy tool that you can create for, um, like I did a demonstration with it about gravity. 
And Zimmer Twins just is very simple, very straightforward uh, in creating things. Nowhere near sophisticated like Beyond. Uh, we used Beyond with a group of uh, students in a, a high school physics class. And we, we were doing some very serious um, discussions around wave formations and uh, frequency, et cetera, et cetera. But that was because the tool lent itself to that. Uh, the other thing that it does, which is almost, I think, a cliche now, is it does the whiteboard thing, you know, where the hand's writing on the whiteboard. Um, that's almost a cliche, though, now. So anyway, that's that'll be that one. Um, this one is near and dear to my heart. Audio has, you could probably guess, Audio has been something that I have been a part of for a very long time. Um, when the University of Louisville had its own little radio station, and I'm not talking about WOL and all that stuff. I'm talking about it was a little just, as far as it got out, I think we were 50 watts, maybe 100, was across the campus. It was located over in Miller Hall, in the, the IT building. If you walk into Miller Hall and you go down the steps there, like you're going to walk over to where McAllister's is, and then you turn the corner and go down the next level of steps, straight ahead of you, you'll see there's a window. That used to be the old um, University of Louisville radio station. <clears throat> and I worked there. I worked there as a guy, uh, you know, spun records and talked about what we were doing here at the University of Louisville. My son, when he went off to college, it's so funny. I never really shared that with anybody. In other words, it was just like something I did. Um, you know, I was a long-haired hippie kid, and I had to have something to do when I was on campus to make a little money. And um, so my, my son goes off to college, University of Minnesota. And he calls me up, and he says, hey, Dad, I'm thinking about... Um, this jockey in here at the University of Minnesota's radio station. What do you think about that idea? I never talked to him about being on radio. <laughs> I just cracked up. I said, okay, I guess it's in the genes. I don't know. Go have fun. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. It's a great gig. So I, I've got a thing for audio. Now that takes us to something that I have a really big thing about, and that is podcasting. Um, I lead the state technology leadership group uh, for kids creating podcasts. In fact, when we have our big state uh, competition in March, I go down to Lexington. We meet with about, mm, it's been about 15 schools on average, although it's growing because podcasts are back. It's, it's, it's an interesting dynamic, the history of it. Podcasts were created as an afterthought when Apple created iTunes. And all they were doing is they were providing a way for people to have a way to post audio that was not of copyrighted material, of course, but of unique and distinct ideas. And Apple was the home of all that. In fact, our, we used to have, we still call it ULEAP around here, University of Louisville Education Activities Podcast. <coughs> Excuse me. We had a server and a whole nine yards. But when Apple pulled out from that, our server went away, and we couldn't do it anymore. But it didn't go away as an idea. And so one of the things I do is I teach kids how to do it, And I counsel them on safe hosting places, Podbean, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're going to do here is we're going to ask you to create an audio story. We're going to be creating it using a tool called Soundation. It is a total audio creation studio. In other words, if you had to come up with a simplified idea, it's GarageBand Online.
and you're going to create an audio story about resiliency. The last thing we'll play with is Google Tour. I have been enamored of Google Tour for a very long time. When Google Earth first came out, one of the things that I was uh, involved with, with a gentleman over here in Arts and Sciences, we created a um, Google map of Floyd's Fork. We were trying to, he had a GIS class. We were trying to get kids to think about in terms of impact on waterways within Jefferson County. Floyd's is an easy one to pick on because, first of all, it's a big waterway. And it has multiple waterways that, that drain into it before it gets down to, um, you know, the Ohio. Um, so David, his name is Dr. David Wicks. David and I basically had kids build this sort of frapple map of the different locations along Floyd's Fork in what they historically uh, represented or in real time, in other words, recreationally, what they represented. Um, and all the different parts of it in the area surrounding it. Farmland, subdivision, industrial. It was a great, it was a great piece of work. We got invited to, to speak before uh, a group of people. Um, some of the names that you probably would recognize. And what happened was that began, not to put too fine a point on it, that began discussions that went on to become the Parklands. Because what our students did so well is they demonstrated how important that waterway was. Now, Google Tour allows you to literally tell a story where you can zoom in and out, take someone on a tour using Google Earth, but it can be as simple as, here is my story of my life. I was born here in this hospital. I grew up in this house, in this neighborhood. I went to college here, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's a fabulous tour. Your final is very straightforward. <laughs> in fact, as hard as, as you, know, you might think um, the whole mayor thing is, you'll be thankful because in the end, the whole mayor uh, experience I will lay it out for you. It's very simple. Here they are. So what we will do is you will take a piece of multimedia. It can be anything from a PowerPoint that you see being used in the classroom. Um, it can be a piece of multimedia that's, that is a YouTube video. Um, it can be a piece of the various, all the multimedia that we are surrounded by in education. You're going to put the link to it or the file, and then you're going to go down through this matrix, and we'll, we'll copy all this over into your wiki. And you're basically going to go through and identify how it either adheres to mayor's principle or how it violates mayor's principle. And the point of the exercise is to open your eyes, I hope, to the whole point of why Mayor, what he has to say, is so important to development of multimedia. Uh, it's been funny. Over the years that we've done this, people have put all kinds of stuff in here. Everything from... Um, the little songs that are on YouTube that teaches kids their one, two, threes, and ABCs. And when we get done with it, the aha moment that they have when they go back and look at that video through Mayor's lens, I call this Mayor's lenses. The, the, the amazing thing about it is they now understand why kids don't get anything out of that. Even though the music is real catchy and all that, when you look at it through mayor's lenses and you see how 
the, the things that has to be happening before it actually is teaching. Now, anything that you show is a presentation. That anything you show, you know, has a little bit of lasting time in your short-term memory. And he doesn't dispute that. What he does dispute is, does it end up in that long-term memory, which is how we build knowledge? We reference back to that long-term memory to make sense of the new information that we're learning. So there you go. Um, we will be very, very busy for the first two or three or four classes uh, focused around, well, I can get you through module one next week very easily. But when we land on mayor, we're going to be busy for a while. It'll easily be three weeks worth of me um, showing you things, talking to you, helping you understand. And we will go through it literally principle by principle by principle uh, to help you understand. At the same time, I'll be showing you all the resources that are in there, as well as the book that you can use to understand mayor. I cannot stress enough to you that... Once you do this whole understanding of mayor, you'll never be able to look at a PowerPoint again the same way. Because now you'll be looking at the PowerPoint going, now I know why that doesn't work. Now I know why I'm not getting out of this PowerPoint. And one of the sad things about it is PowerPoint is the, the tool of choice of all college professors. But yet when you go and sit in a college, in a, sit in a presentation of PowerPoint in a college class, um, the violations of mayor are just staggering. And the point is, it isn't necessarily that it's not stylistic. Uh, that's the other thing I, I need to make clear. We'll, we'll do a little fun thing with some stylistic stuff. But it's, it's not necessarily style. In other words, cute pictures, uh, clarity pictures, and so on. Although he talks about that. It has to do with the way things work with each other. And it goes back to that dual channel. It goes always back to that dual channel and how we process information. Okay. I'm going to call it quits because, as you've been hearing, I'm getting ready to go into a coughing fit, and you don't need to be hearing that in the recording. Uh, as always... I imagine, Mark, you're getting a little tired of hearing this. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, um, follow-up, you can reach me at uh, text number 502-457-2937. Or I get away. Let me drop into here real fast. So here's the assignments. You know how these work. Um, but basically, all they are is I copy over what it says on the module page, and I put it in here. And then when you click on the link up here, it takes you to the place where you're going to be. All you're doing is you're going to take the link, the URL that represents that page in your wiki, and you're going to put it here into this uh, assignment. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the assignments basically ask you to kind of give a little bit, you know, background of why what this thing you created is about, but nothing real serious. Um, the let me show you real fast. Here's the voice thread page. And the way you'll do this is you will be in the voice thread already. In other words, there's nothing you have to do. And as you can see here, I've got a couple in here already to kind of demonstrate it to you uh, when we get going. Uh, if you look at this one, um, as you can see, what Carrie did is she created a voice thread and then you basically can just click through it or you can turn it on to where it just runs by itself. Um, and then if you want to have people react to your voice thread or to give you feedback, they click on this little plus button here and they can come up here and click on the microphone where they can record themselves. The other thing that you do, and this is this is the one thing that I think that VoiceThread does need to clean up, and I've been I served on their board for a little while. <clears throat> when you create your VoiceThread, 
you're going to use this same set of tools to put your narration in. Now, narration is a separate thing than commenting. So commenting is what people do when they watch your voice thread. The narration is what you say in the voice thread. And so when you invite people through the narration to then give you feedback or remember one of the things, well, we'll talk about it when we get to it. There. See, she's got a question. And so the thing that... that you'll be doing is you'll be asking these questions and I'll be responding to you and everybody else that's in the class. Okay. So that's voice thread. It's um, like I said, it's very simple to use. And the way we work it is um, when you make a share here, you can get a embeddable copy through the export feature. And then you can basically just, Paste that in and it shows up. Okay. So that's everything I've got to show you tonight. Thank you all for being here. Um, when I come back next week, we will start building our first module. And we could go ahead at the same time we build this wiki space. We can go ahead and copy the URL of it to the assignment because it becomes the place where everything resides. We can get one assignment totally out of the way by the end of the next week. Thank you for being here. Hopefully I'll be done with all this coughing and I'll be nice and clear and won't have any troubles. See you next week. If you have any questions for me, as I've already said, just let me know. He's out.